Hello, my name is Susan Kozell and I'm recording this video from Malmö in southern Sweden. I'm currently a professor in the School of Arts and Culture at Malmö University and today I'm going to talk to you about phenomenology. I'm calling this video a phenomenology in five acts. You might notice that my focus shifts because I'm going to be reading from a script at times and I have uh, other paper books that I'll be reading from. I come from dance and philosophy. In 1993 I found myself performing in an interactive installation and since then I've been specializing in dance and technology but also in different uh, performance modalities such as art installation, participatory performances, workshops, performances over time which we would call endurance performance, wearable computing, performances with social media. And all of this work has been in collaboration with other artists, musicians, dancers, engineers, architects. And currently, I'm still making work and writing about it. Today, I won't discuss the many forms or locations or technologies a performance can take place in or can use, but I'll emphasize the way that we can reflect on the process. And I will say that I'm delighted to be taking part as a guest artist in this um, practice-based research in the arts course. Even before I explain phenomenology, I would like to situate it as a way for you to create content as well as a way for you to reflect upon it in academic or critical modes. In effect, this is a creative and a critical methodology. I will also probably slide across the words method and methodology, but I should say that in general, strictly speaking, methodology refers to the umbrella term which contains the wider implications of choosing a method, such as the worldview, the ethics, um, the ontology. Method usually refers to the step-by-step -step approach of it, but I may, as I said, just refer to both terms. Phenomenology is a word that has as its, at its root phenomenon, which means something that happens. It is one of the subjective experience-based methodologies that, along with autoethnography at the moment, is receiving a lot of attention. A bit of history. It was founded by Edmund Husserl, philosopher, at the end of the 19th century, and it refers to a return to lived experience. In fact, that was the phrase that um, became, in a way, the mantra of phenomenology, a return to lived experience. It was popular in the early to mid 20th century as a way to anchor otherwise abstract thought into the lives, events, sensations, and actions of real people. Maurice Merleau-Ponty closely examined perception and, in his later writings, he was fascinated by how the painter Cezanne saw the world and created his paintings. He was fascinated by the relation between the eye, the hand, and the creation of the painting. Having said that, it's important to note that the early phenomenologists did not really ground their phenomenology in creative processes, but they left the door open for the rest of us to do this. And this is exactly what has been happening a lot for the past 10 years or so. Phenomenology is used to anchor practice within research to overcome several unhelpful divides. The first unhelpful divide that phenomenology helps to overcome is that between theory and practice. The second divide that phenomenology can be used to overcome is that between mind and body. And the third unhelpful divide is that between solitary experience and shared experiences. Each of these unhelpful divides, once you move beyond them, you end up in a position where you can really helpfully examine and understand and reflect upon performance work because so much performance work at the moment is already from a ground beyond, beyond these old dualities. This video has several sections. You can call them sections or movements or acts. I think we should use the theatrical metaphor and say that what you just heard was act one, the introduction. 
I'll briefly say where we're going from here. In Act 2, I will take you through some sections from my book, Closer, which is on the reading list. I'll also refer to a chapter I wrote recently for a Routledge collection on research in the arts, edited by Carlson and Biggs, that came out in 2010. And throughout my discussion, I will indicate several points for deeper reading. I realise that now I'm speaking to quite a diverse audience of practitioners. Some of you may be interested in opening this up to deeper research and reflections in a more academic mode, whereas some of you may not find this interesting at all. I invite you to just let that wash over you if that's the case. Act 3 will take you through a series of instructions for how to do a phenomenology from the book Closer. Then you will have a chance to pause the video and practice doing your own phenomenology. You can apply phenomenological instructions to a project you are developing for this course, or you can simply try some free movement improvisation, manipulation of objects, or experimentation with text. Have a notebook with you, or if you are thoroughly digital, use a computer or other devices to take your notes. In Act 4, I will open out a little bit further two aspects of phenomenology, First, the process phase of a phenomenology, and second, the idea that phenomenology can access more subtle emotions, affects, and liminal qualities. In other words, we will move from a phenomenology of the senses to a phenomenology of affect. In Act 5, I'll offer a slightly revised method, attempting to get at affect, and we'll have a pause for improvisation and note-taking. Let's see if we can get through all this in the next 10 minutes. Act 2. Reading from Closer. As a method, phenomenology involves a return to lived experience, a listening to the senses and insights that arrive obliquely, unbidden, in the midst of movement experiments, or quite simply, in the midst of life. Phenomenology, in short, helps me to respect these sensations and inner voices, these unformed ideas, thoughts, or images that emerge directly from the experience of being in computational systems, such as telematics, motion capture, or networked wearable computing. Bodies are more than just meat. They are sources of intelligence, compassion, and extraordinary creativity. In some respects, the book Closer comes from a personal and creative place. I needed a methodology to allow for a passion for philosophical concepts to converge with innate ideas and even critiques that were embedded in my body and surfaced through my performance experiments. I needed a methodology that would not only respect my highly subjective embodied experiences but that might provide a dynamics for revealing broader cultural assumptions and practices, for acknowledging the reality that all bodies exist with and through other bodies in social and political contexts. And I needed a methodology that operated through resonance rather than through truth. This is to say that my experience is not going to be held up as a truth to be mapped onto other people across time and cultures, but it is to say that one person's embodied experience, when it is reflected upon, may actually open out meaning or resonances for other people's. I now see, as I look back at writing closer, that my motivation was to reconcile what I experienced with what others were saying. At that time, I worked as a dancer in various early um, virtual reality or media, interactive media installations. And it was in the early 90s, the heyday of the cyberpunk era. So there was a lot of rhetoric around leaving the body behind on how digital technologies were this glorious freedom that allowed us to escape from the dead weight, the decay even, of the meat of the body. My experience, however, in interactive installation was exactly the opposite. And I actually needed a way of 
understanding and then writing about in a critical academic mode my experience so that I could provide a counterpoint to what was being said at the time. I should say it was very empowering too because dancers are often dismissed as the aesthetic demonstration of a virtual environment or a sensing system. There is clearly a gendered component here of the sort when an object begins to talk back. The body, effectively, the dancing body, my dancing body, began to disagree with what was being said about the technologies, and phenomenology gave me a way to articulate and expand this. Now here's a point for deeper reading. For those of you who are interested in artistic research, it's from the, my chapter in that book, the Biggs and Carlson book. I suggest that phenomenology, when it's used in an artistic research context, begins by revisiting basic tensions between practice and theory, revealing a deep entanglement between the two. Instead of trying to stitch these domains together in a grand unifying gesture that still preserves a fundamental antinomy, a shift of perspective is enacted. By viewing both theoretical and practical pursuits in terms of motion and materiality, it is possible to avoid reinforcing such unhelpful distinctions. I will say also that phenomenology is a process, and in that chapter for the Artistic Research Collection, I described improvising with a new piece of software. At first, in the rehearsal process, I was planted in front of the computer monitor to see what the software was doing to my movement in real time. Over days and weeks of rehearsal, I began to discover that I didn't have to be so visually tied to what was happening. I began to move more freely, and by the end, I had an intuitive sense, almost as if there were eyes in the back of my head, of what the software was doing to my movement, and according to what aesthetic, and what time lag, and what kinesthetic qualities. The content that I'm describing is less significant than the fact that phenomenology can grow with you through your devising process of a performance. It is not, in effect, just a one-shot analysis like an ethnographic questionnaire. If you develop your reflective practices, they will offer different material to you as your work develops. Sometimes a phenomenological reflection will open up questions, sometimes you'll have insights, sometimes frustration, and sometimes, well, sometimes nothing. A bit like life, really. Act three. Now, the method. So we're working up to a moment where you'll pause and do some improvisation. I'm reading from page 53 of this book, if you happen to have it. No, page 52, the very bottom. Here I quote Varela and Cher, who um, have done interesting work on phenomenology from the perspective of biology, so one of the hard sciences. And they say that this method for investigation has two main dimensions. One is a procedure for accessing the phenomenal domain, which is to say experience. And the other is a means for expression and validation within a community. At the beginning of this video, I emphasized another dim uh, dimension, which is that phenomenology can actually help you create your artistic content. You're not just accessing and understanding experience or validating it, you're creating it. And here, I'm going to go through in a reasonably quick way steps of how to do a phenomenological uh, reflection, phenomenological inquiry. For those of you who might have practices in mindfulness meditation, you will notice a certain similarity here as we go on. I'm going to leave out some steps, so you might be interested afterwards in going back to the text and reading in the, the, um, the detail. First, take your attention to this very moment. Suspend the main flow of thought. Call your attention to your body and what you are experiencing. Are you short of breath? Is your back hurting? Are you hungry? Now witness what you see, hear and touch. How space feels, temperature, 
and how the inside of your body feels in relation to the outside. Are there others around you? What thoughts enter your mind once you suspend the main rational flow of thought? Register any seemingly trivial anxieties or thoughts, but do not try to delve into their deeper significance at this moment. Let your mind wander and notice lateral associations. Your sense data retrieval depends on your context. <coughs> Do what seems appropriate. Spend some time getting in touch with your senses. Identify whether some dominate. Spend more time. Push beyond your boredom threshold. Now take a break. A moment, a day, a week, a year. Describe what you experienced. Take notes, record sounds or images. Your initial notes can be a sort of brain dump. Do not worry about style, grammar or relevance at this stage. Take a break. A moment, a day, a week, a year. Re-examine your notes with an eye for what seems significant. Pull some of these out and identify where there may be deeper conceptual relevance. Now conceptual relevance here might be theoretical ideas, um, but it may also be the deeper grounds of what it is you're trying to communicate with your performance, whether it's political or whether there are other um, emotional or interpersonal narratives. Begin to write or compose your document. Select your voice, style, or audience. And exchange the early phases of your development of your phenomenology with a trusted colleague so that they can feed back on it. I'm going to ask you now to pause the video. I'll turn my head to the side for pausing, if you choose to do this. And then when I turn back, um, we will continue. Have a notebook with you. Give it a try. You might want this to just be a withdrawal into your senses or a play across your internal sensing and your external sensing. Or you may actually want to try and apply this here and now to the project that you're developing for this, this practice-based research course. Now we're back. Act 4. I will open out a little further two aspects of phenomenology. First, the process phase of a phenomenology. And second, phenomenology of affect. The reflections on process are from a piece of writing I have just completed, which will be included in a collection on phenomenology and performance studies. I believe it's called Modes of Embodiment. It'll be in your bibliography. The second, the consideration of affect, comes from a current artistic collaboration with uh, screen dance artist Jeanette Ganslov, and it also appears in some writing in your bibliography. I suggest here that if we refine our tools somewhat, phenomenology can access more subtle emotions, affects, and liminal qualities. In other words, we move from a phenomenology of senses, sense description, to a phenomenology of affect. In revealing the intermediary space between raw motion or affect and academic writing, I confront the accusation that academic writing deadens, dampens or diminishes experience into the accepted discourses of academic research. Philosopher Peter Sloterdijk aptly characterizes the problem with the mode of writing most often used for scholarly journals, books and artistic catalogues as adopting the detached intellectual style of a dead person on holiday. Naturally, he elaborates, we do not mean dead according to the undertakers, but the philosophically dead who cast off their bodies and apparently become pure intellects or impersonal thinking souls. Jean-Luc Nancy identifies a similar problem, calling it philosophical anesthesia. So, how do we tackle this dead person on holiday problem? 
Obviously, the writing you do, the writing you produce, can take different voices or styles, but right now I want to take a moment to focus on process. Phenomenology is a method of description, but it's worth noting that the first stages of a phenomenology, of translating experience into writing or research, do not have to take place in smooth, descriptive writing. Your notes can be drawings, scribbles, isolated words, or even sounds. Phenomenology, like all artistic and intellectual undertakings, develops through limitations, adaptations, and, inver and inversions. I'm not prepared just now to offer new step-by-step -step instructions for how to do a phenomenology, given how inadequate my first attempt now seems. However, to stir things up even further, I will introduce Jean-Luc Nancy's instructions on how to do a phenomenology of listening, based on his deep reflections on music, sound and resonance. Nancy's writing on music aims not to be restrained by language. He has some recommendations for how to do this in relation to music and listening. Here is one of them. Treat the body as a resonance chamber or column beyond meaning, like the part of a violin that transmits vibrations. In simple terms, Nancy helps us move from a phenomenology that is a description of the senses, I saw this, I felt that, I heard this, to one that is a phenomenology of affect. Affect is a term that refers to the more liminal and less clearly defined qualities of experience. Affect is frequently reduced to emotion, and this is a good starting point. But affect can refer to the domain of impressions, intuition, memories, imagination, or even the feeling that hangs in a room. In theatre and performance, we work on an affective level all the time. Affect is what is conveyed in between the words or gestures. It is the unspoken. Sometimes it falls between the senses too, or it goes beyond them. Affect is also a sort of exchange of forces between people, or between people and objects. The outer world and structures are also part of it. It has been called a shimmer, or a ripple, in affect theory. Phenomenologies of affect can include set design, costumes, music, lighting, or what in performance we use to create the feel or the mood of a piece. And now here's Act 5, just as I close, to give you an opportunity to practice the second variation on phenomenology. This revised method. Pause for a second improvisation. Think of your body now as a resonance chamber. Or just try to sense that which is more subtle, either inside your body on a somatic level or outside your body, or what travels between people. Possibly do this experiment in a public area where you can actually sense a dynamic exchange. Try a different note-taking strategy, like using drawing, scribbles, colours or sounds, fragments of words or non-words. A note again for those of you who may be working digitally, you can try a camera for visual sketches. Perhaps this will let you capture affect or more liminal qualities. I'm going to end here because I think I'm slightly over time. I'd like to say goodbye and thank you for listening and good luck with your phenomenological and performance experiments.